All right, we're on. You're listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, Rish Outfield, Big Anklevich, and O-H-O-T. Verily, verily, I say unto you, welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 3, page 106. Wow, really? Yeah. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. That's the robot. O eight O T, and I am an outer man. Oh, you know we're gonna have to ask you guys to participate in the conversation a little bit more this week. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, it was just me and Big talking last time. Uh huh. Do you want to announce the, uh, the the name of the story, announcer man? I'm just an announcer. Right, but do you want to announce the name of the story? I, maybe I phrased it badly the first time. No. Well, maybe. No way. All right, I'm glad you gave that some thought. <clears throat> I apologize to all of you who have already grown tired of our shenanigans. <laughs> Tonight's story is Maps of the Bible by Jason Sanford. Jason Sanford is a science fiction writer who loves, and yes, he said we could quote him on it, loves how the Dune Steve keeps creating audio downloads of his stories. Jason has published a number of stories in the British SF magazine Interzone, including Sublimation Angels, which is a finalist for this year's Nebula Award for Best Novella. Those of you who can vote, get to it. His other stories have been published in Analog, Intergalactic Medicine Show, Year's Best SF-14, and that competing audio fiction magazine, Starship Sofa. I'm sure the readers of that particular episode weren't as good as us. Yeah. His website is www.jasonsanford.com. We'd also like to thank Julie Hoverson and Josh Roseman for lending their voices to today's episode. There's links in the show notes. Maps of the Bible by Jason Sanford Map 1 World of the Patriarchs, including the possible locations of Sodom and Gomorrah, the route of the journeys of Abraham, and Wetumpka, Alabama in 1962. A dead man's Bible. My Bible. Jedediah holds it to his nose as if the acid paper crisp and saddle stitch decay still keeps me alive. Jed does this every Sunday before getting dressed for church. He rubs his hands across the Bible's crack-worn leather and lets his fingers pick at the flaking yellow tape that patches the bayonet slice across the front cover. My son barely remembers me, but he loves my Bible. Last Christmas, my damn brother-in-law Hank gave Jed a new Bible with slick leather, gold-trimmed pages, and the words of Christ in red. It sits unread on Jed's little bookshelf. You see, Jed's got sense. He knows a dead father's Bible, a dead father killed in Korea war hero Bible, is worth more than all the new in the world. <laughs> That's got to drive Hank crazy. Jed, come on. Eliz yells softly from the kitchen. Jed walks stiffly down the hall. He's outgrown all his good clothes, and now his belt cinches tight on the last hole, and he hunches over slightly to avoid popping out the back seam of his blue blazer. All that fits are his socks and penny loafers. In the tongue notch of the right shoe, he keeps an Indian head penny that Eliz says I gave to Jed when he was a baby. I didn't, but it's a good-hearted lie, and I appreciate her for saying it. In the kitchen, Eliz inspects Jed. My wife is wearing a modest white dress with embroidered flowers that rise and fall across her lovely breasts. She spins Jed like a top, then stops him face forward. Almost time for new pants, I see. Definitely need a bigger blazer. Yes, ma'am. Before they leave, Eliz puts a lemon cake with vanilla frosting in a small basket and covers it with a towel. Eliz rarely puts this much effort into Jed's clothes or cakes, but today a traveling preacher is visiting the church. His name is Brother Daniel Satorius. Dan. He grew up with me. 
was best friends with me. But Liz ain't making all this effort because of what Dan once meant to my dead self. You be sure and tell Brother Satorius you want to be a preacher when you grow up, she says. Yes, ma'am. Stay away from Dan, I yell without words. Anything he says about me is a lie. But Jed can't hear me as they get into that old Ford car of mine. Back at Cho Sin Reservoir, Dan and I often wished we'd had that Ford to bust out of that damn Chinese trap. Could have outrun anything with that car, even with the stiff-up Korean cold, which killed machines and rifles and men. Liz still sends letters every few months, seeking new information on me. Those dumbass Pentagon paper pushers always send the same form letter back. Billy Stanton is still considered killed in action. Location of body unknown. Lord, give my wife the truth. Give it to her good. Just don't let Dan be the one to do it. As Eliz drives away, Jed rubs two quick wipes of his hands across the leather of my Bible. He does this because Eliz once told him the Bibles cracked and went brittle if you didn't hold them occasionally and mix hand oils into their leather. He then opens the Bible to the black and white maps in the back and traces travel routes to the places he wants to one day see. Don't go there, I mutter as his fingers dance across Asia into Korea. I stir up a slight breeze and the Bible pages flutter until he's looking at a map of ancient Egypt. Lies of love, whispered fables, stories of a special one, weapons of mass emotion. Towers crashing all around Tell me lies, tell me secrets Promises you'll never keep Tell me that I'm not heading down The wrong way on a one-way street Map 2, Exodus from Egypt and the Conquest of Canaan Including the probable route of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness on the way to church, Eliz picks up her brother, Hank. Hank is 20 years older than Eliz, so much older that I once asked if their parents had been surprised at Eliz's birth. Hank said their mom had just turned 50, so of course they were surprised. He then added that this gave his little sister a purpose in life, that it faded her toward greater things than getting pregnant at 17 and married to me. His comments like that which made Hank unwelcome in my house when I was alive. Hank eases carefully into the car so he doesn't crease or wrinkle his suit, which is tight on his body, just like Jed's clothes. Hank's a big man from his work as a lineman for the telephone company. And Liz swears she once saw Hank lift an entire telephone pole by himself, and I've never doubted she was telling the truth. Jed's favorite bedtime story is how his Uncle Hank once slammed a grown man through a solid oak door. This happened when Jed was a baby, but he's heard it so many times he half believes it's his own memory. Well, the story starts on one of those rare Sunday afternoons where Hank wanted everyone to go to a restaurant for after-church dinner instead of just eating at someone's house. Anyway, this damn drunk man at the table behind them started cursing at the top of his lungs, cursing the food, cursing the waitress, cursing the whole room. Hank warned the man to hush up. He said that there were women and children present, and besides, that was no way to talk on the Lord's Day. In response, the man cursed Hank. Dumb. Dumb ass. Hank stood up, turned around, and punched that man through the bolted shut side door of the restaurant. The police later said Hank had done the right thing. They also had the decency to let an ambulance take the unconscious man to the hospital before they arrested him. As Hank sits down in the passenger seat, the car rocks heavy to the right. Jed keeps the rocking going by slamming his weight from side to side in the back seat. Stop that! Liz says. <laughs> Hank laughs and helps Jed keep rocking the car until Liz glares at them both. I see you got that lemon cake, Hank says. Bet that'll get Brother Satorius to give up his wandering ways. Hush up or you won't even get to Liz smell the cake. Liz tells Hank to hush up or he won't even get to smell the cake. Who says a widow can't have spice? I feel Jed. He's still thinking about the story of Hank punching a man through a door. What Jed don't know is that the man was me. It was me cursing because Hank wouldn't let me sit down beside my own wife in a restaurant, just on account of me being drunk on a Sunday. When I came before the judge for that, he took into account my past troubles and said I could do six months in jail or two years in the Marines. Dan had joined the Marines a few weeks earlier. 
So I told the judge that's what I'd do. Damn bad choice. That's what hindsight gets me to knowing. <laughs> Three, Wetumpka, from 1932 to 1952, including the digging of the mine and God's introduction of fire ants. It sounds so good, the way me and Dan and Eliz grew up. We all lived on this little country road outside Wetumpka, with Dan's house just a hundred feet from mine and Eliz's just another quarter mile away. The three of us played together near our homes almost every day, and I probably spent more nights sleeping at Dan's house than in my own home. Truth told, they suited my family. My dad cut lumber and spent months at a time on different logging jobs across Alabama. My mom liked this, and when my dad wouldn't be coming back for a while, she'd also disappear for a few days or weeks. During these times, I lived with Dan's family, who took me in without a word about my parents or what they might be doing. Dan, Eliz, and I had so many places to play, we had trouble deciding where to go. Sometimes we'd play hide-and-seek in the cotton fields behind our houses, other times, we'd go to this V-cut ravine, where the waters off the nearby fields sliced a hundred fifty feet down into the land. We'd climb the eroding slopes and pretend the sun-baked clays were distant mountains and far-off lands. Once, the three of us dug a mine shaft high up on one of the older parts of the ravine. We dug twelve feet into that clay before Hank came looking for a Liz and told us to stop. He called us fools, said we were going to get caved in on and killed. After he took Liz back home, Dan and I went back to digging, and we soon dug right into the guts of a fire ant bed. Fire ants were still new to Alabama, and we'd never even seen one until those ants poured over us, and we ran screaming and crying to Dan's house. His father looked at us and the dozens of welts on our arms and legs and said, Well, dang, so that's what a fire ant does. Years later, in Korea... Dan read a Stars and Stripes newspaper article that said fire ants came from South America and had been introduced to the United States by way of Alabama. We both felt a strange honor at reading about our home state in a newspaper in Korea. The mine we dug is still there. Once, when Jed was visiting Hank's house, Jed went exploring and found it. Before he could poke his head in, I floated in and suddenly knew that Hank had been right. That hole could collapse and kill a kid. Don't go in, Yellow Hawk, I yelled using the nickname I'd given Jed as a baby. Suddenly, he stopped and listened. I felt his only memory of me flash through his head, a memory of the metal toy car I bought him before I left for Korea. The car had been painted yellow, had racing stickers on the hood, and we used to push it back and forth across the wood plank floor of our house. Instead of entering the mine, Jed ran to Eliz and asked about if his father had ever given him a nickname. Eliz looked horrified at not being able to remember it. I'm sorry, she said. It's been so long. For the next week, Jed kept after her to remember. But she never could. Yellow Hawk, I said. Yellow Hawk. Repercussions from the process Fault lines running through the heart Flaming steps at reproduction Conquering heroes on the Prophets in Israel and Judah, including where Jonah was swallowed by the fish, and Elijah goes up to heaven in a whirlwind. The Wetumpka Church of Christ is a three-room affair, with two small classrooms and a main hall where 40 people can gather on the whitewashed oak pews. Hank, Liz, and I grew up in this church, and half the people here are related by strange ancestral routes, which means the marrying options for those not related are by necessity limited. At least that's how Hank once explained away me and Eliz getting married. When I said I thought it was because I got her pregnant at 17, Hank backhanded me harder than most men could hit with a two-by-four. Anyway, nothing has changed in the church since I was a kid. For example, there's been an argument going on for 40 years over whether or not to buy cushions for the pews, with some of the church's older sisters wanting them, while another group of equally old sisters says cushions would make people get too comfortable in the presence of the Lord. 
All this means that when Jed sits down, his butt slides over the same splinters that mine once endured. The service has a while to start, so Jed folds an airplane out of scrap paper he keeps in my Bible. He's just finishing the wings when his cousin, Elijah, sits down. Elijah's fourteen, three years older than Jed, but Jed feels that Elijah's really the younger one. Did you see the preacher's car? Elijah asks. Jed shakes his head. It had to be towed here. Brother Satorius lost control in some mud, hit a tree, and bent his axle. Let's go look, Jed says. They bolt to the door, go sit but Liz down. tells them both to go sit down. No playing in your suit, she warns. So Jed and Elijah build paper airplanes. Of course, the temptation of paper airplanes is that they must fly. So Jedediah and Elijah spread apart on the pew and toss the plane back and forth, where it climbs and dives, just like a corsair bombing the shit out of anything moving. Pa told me Brother Satorius fought in Korea with your dad, Elijah says, catching the airplane by smacking his hands together in a silent clap. He unwrinkles the wings and flings it back to Jed. Never heard that, Jed says. That's because he ain't listening to me, and Liz tells him nothing. Jed throws the plane back to Elijah just as Hank stands to start the church service, causing the congregation to go quiet. Now me, I ain't much of a haint. I can't wail at midnight or rise glowing from a grave. Still, I can flutter a little air. I jump Jed's airplane in mid-flight so it flies up high until it's right before Hank's eyes. Of course, I'd meant to put it into one of Hank's eyes, but it still gets him to coughing in anger as he grips the podium. Elijah and Jed grab their Bibles and pretend to read. Hank leads the congregation in a song, a prayer, then announcements. There will be a fish fry next Sunday, he says. See Sister Sanford to sign up on what to bring. After three more songs and another prayer, it's time for the sermon. Hank usually gives the sermon, going on and on for what seemed like hours, but today he simply introduces Brother Dan Satorius and sits down. Dan walks to the podium. Hey, stick man, I yell. Back in high school, stick man was his nickname. Even when he and I played on the football team, Dan didn't have muscles or coordination and was stuck at third-string defensive tackle until, damn, if that ain't the way with him, the two guys in front of him got hurt. Dan then started six games and actually made some plays. The coach would say, Stick man, get the hell in there and wrap someone up. That was all Dan could do, wrap his long arms around the runner, hold on and hope he eventually made the guy trip or something. So Dan is still stick man as he spreads his stick arms above the podium and says, Amazing. That God can grow him as big as Brother Hank. Praise the Lord, but Brother Hank's already halfway to heaven by size alone. <laughs> the congregation laughs. The prophet Elijah, Dan continues, found everything he was within his name. The literal meaning of his name was, The Lord is my God. How many of us here today could live up to a name like that? If our name was something like, everything I do represents the Lord, would you be able to do everything for the Lord? On the pew next to Jed, Elijah laughs. So that's what I mean, he says. Means I'm practically saved already. Means you're gonna get beat if you don't hush, Jed says. Jed watches Dan. I know my little yellow hawk. All his life in church and he can't remember even one sermon. Oh, I can feel him remembering lines from sermons here and there. But in truth... Sermons blur into a messy gunk for Jed. He knows the words of my Bible backward and forward, knows everything he's supposed to learn in Bible school. But until Dan speaks, my son's never known the inspiration that one man's words can make. Could not help a people of the land. So God Dan's words fly Elijah. through my son. People, people worshiping the idol Baal goes into God bringing Elijah, goes into God bringing a drought, goes into Elijah showing how powerless Baal is against the Lord Almighty. To the people, thereby showing how could anyone consider that idol a god if it couldn't even bring the rains? Dan asks. No rain meant no little god. Jed understands. He rubs my old Bible and truly understands. You think Brother Satorius really was there with my dad? He asks Elijah. Hell yeah, I say. Hellfire, yeah, he was there. And back then it wasn't Brother Satorius. It was just plain old Dan who found me wounded on that frozen ground and couldn't do a thing because I was bayoneted good and going on dead. I don't deserve Dan. My 
5. Jesus' Ministry, Including the Transfiguration and All of His Miracles Dan is talking and greeting the congregation as they file out the front doors. Each man or woman waits in line until they reach Dan. Then they say stuff like, Lovely sermon, Brother Sartorius! Or shake his hands and mutter how good he is to be spreading the word of God across this heathen land. When Hank gets to Dan, Hank leans in and whispers that he's going to steal Dan's sermon next time he finds a church that ain't heard it. They grin as if sharing a secret preacher joke. As Jed approaches the preacher, I try to get Dan's attention, but he's only looking at my son. I tell Jed not to listen to Dan, but that only gets Jed to cock his eyes briefly at the door, as if hearing a ways away echo. And hey, what's your name, young man? Dan asks. Jedediah Stanton, he says. Don't tell him, I scream at Dan, who also cocks his head for a moment before shaking me off. Mighty fine to meet you, Dan says. Heard a lot of good things about you. Behind Dan, Hank nods to Jed. Jed stumbles for what to say. I really learned a lot today, Brother Sartorius. He searches for more words. It's the first time I've listened to a sermon. Hank's eyes cloud over, but a laugh from Dan stops him from saying anything. I know what you mean, Dan says. Sometimes we preachers just drone on and on. You can't remember anything we said, just that you liked what you heard and you'll come back next Sunday. I'm honored that you got something specific from my talk. Hank frowns at the droning and droning part. Ha, oh, damn, Hank, but you know Dan's speaking the truth. <laughs> then he finally <laughs>, laughs and clasps Jed on the shoulder. Maybe we should get you up there one day, Hank says. Keep me from droning so much. Jed nods. He starts to run out the door to join Elijah, but Dan grabs him. You need to talk with me after dinner today, Dan whispers in Jed's ear. After Jed nods, I whisper into Dan's ears. Leave my son alone. He don't need to know any more than he already knows. The problem with being dead is people don't listen to you. Sort of like when Hank gives a sermon. Not a chance for reciprocation. Not a glance from the other side. That looks reserved only for the chosen. Blessed with the gift of golden shine. Tell me lies, tell me secrets. Promises you'll never keep. Tell me that. Six, Jerusalem in Jesus' time, including the site of the Last Supper and the conning of the rich man. Sunday dinner's at Hank's house, so everyone piles into two cars and drives over. Dan sits in the front with Liz and talks as she steers. Not been too long, is it, Liz? He asks. Jed sits in the back seat, waving at Elijah and Hank and everyone in the car behind them. Not been too long, Liz says. Jed miss his and says he agrees that Dan's sermon wasn't too long. I really liked it, Mom. Did you know that Elijah's name means he's the Lord my God? Liz and Dan laugh. <laughs> means the Lord is my God, Liz says. It's a good thing your cousin was born before you, or you'd have been named Elijah. She looks at Dan quick like before turning back to the road. Remember Papa Elijah, Dan? Couldn't forget. Dan says. He come by Billy's house every few days of first light with fresh milk and eggs. If he caught any of us kids asleep, he'd yank us out of bed, sling us by the legs to the water trough, and dunk us awake. First time I came by when I was sleeping over, I didn't know why Billy bolted that bed so quick until Papa Elijah had me upside down by the ankle, going head first up and down in the water, and it was midwinter, mind you, frost everywhere. Dan turns to Jed. You know who Billy is? He says. Jed shakes his head. That's your father. We grew up together, lived just a hundred feet apart. They gonna fix your car, Brother Sartorius? Jed asks. You bet. But it's gonna take a day or two. Dan smiles. Guess God is trying to tell me something. Liz gently touches Dan's hand and shakes her head so Jed can't see. Dan makes an offhand comment about the car riding well, then keeps quiet for the rest of the ride. The car. I shouldn't be jealous of Dan because he's helped me in so many ways. Like the car. Without Dan, Liz wouldn't be driving this old Ford. I mean, how many 20-year-old guys give their wife a new car when they're about to go to war? I got the car a week after I told the judge I'd joined the Marines. I was hanging around Manus's gas station where Dan worked as a mechanic and tow truck driver. When Dan pulled up in the tow truck with a muddy car racked up behind him. 
Belongs to one of Montclair's sons, Dan said. The idiot parked down the boat ramp but forgot to set the brake. Dan and I inspected the car. It was a 52 Ford Victoria. I ran my finger across the hood and traced a purple stripe in the mud. There was a big wheel cover over the back bumper, fins coming out to a point over the lights, and what looked like chrome all over the place. There's a beautiful car under that mud, I said. Dan agreed, but he was more excited about something in his pockets. He slapped around in his overalls until he finally found what he was looking for, the keys to the car. Mr. Montclair gave him to me as I was pulling the car out of the river, he said. I must have looked dumb, because he slugged me in the arm. The car was turned off when it went in, he said. Ain't nothing wrong with it but a lot of mud and water. Well, that got me excited. If the car hadn't been running, then water probably hadn't gotten sucked into the engine. Probably only needed a little work to get it going again. Is Manus here? Dan asked. No. Dan dragged me to the garage and told me to put on an old work shirt. Soon, Mr. Montclair and one of his sons drove up in a large Cadillac. Montclair and his family had only recently moved to the area from Birmingham. He was building a factory north of Wetumpka near Martin Dam. How much is it going to cost? Mr. Montclair asked, walking carefully around the mud drip puddle caused by the car. Can't say, Dan said. The engine will have to be replaced, along with the seats and dash and just about everything but the metal. Montclair shook his head. Son, he said, looking at Dan. I wasn't born yesterday. Doing all that costs more than just buying a new car. Yes, sir. But water in the engine? Nothing I can do to fix that but put a new one in. Dan and I stood quietly while Montclair walked around the car some more. How much to just tow it off somewhere? Twenty dollars, Dan said. Montclair gave him the money and got back in his Cadillac. Dan and I towed the car to his house, where we washed it down good, took the seats out and dried them in the sun, then spent five hours getting the water out and changing the oil, air filter, and spark plugs before we drained the gas tank and filled it back up. When we put the key in, the car started with a roar. You ought to give it to a Liz, Dan said. Thrill her with something other than you going away. I did. A Liz never loved me as much as those two weeks between the giving of the car and me leaving for basic training. She'd sit in the passenger seat and hold Jed in her lap while we raced the hills and back roads with the road dust swirling all around us. Hell, Jed probably thought he was flying just like a yellow hawk. Good memories. I got Dan to thank for it. Map 7. The Apostles' Early Travels, including the traditional location where Philip meets the eunuch. Jed sits between Dan and Eliz on the back porch of Hank's house. Normally, Eliz would be inside with Malky, Hank's wife, making Sunday dinner. Instead, she's out here, and Hank's in there, actually trying to cook something. Every few minutes, Elijah comes walking around the porch to see if Jed wants to go play. Go play, I say. But Jed stays and talks with Dan. How do you get to be a preacher? Jed asks. I mean, how'd you write that sermon? Dan laughs. <laughs> Good sermons are like castor oil, he says. They move through you when you need it. Jed laughs, and Eliz makes a face. Just kidding, Eliz, Dan adds. Jed waits for Dan to tell him more about where sermons come from, but Dan doesn't. Truth is, Dan's never been good at explaining stuff. Either something just comes to him, or it doesn't. When the Marines loaded us on our troop ship, someone told Dan that it was summer right then in Korea. For the next two weeks, Dan kept telling everyone who'd listen that the seasons in Asia were the reverse of America. It's winter in America means it's summer in Korea, he'd say. You know, me and my buddy then Billy add that him and his buddy Billy were used, used to the heat. We were, were built Alabama. for the heat. When the troop ship docked in Korea and the coldest wind we'd ever felt ripped our clothes apart, Everyone kept asking Dan if he was built for this heat. Dan didn't say a word. He just eased up against me as we formed a human windbreak. The wind is gusting dust around the back porch where Dan and Eliz and Jed sit, so I grab me a handful and throw it toward them. It misses them and whips into a little dust devil that dances away from the house. That means the devil's angry because you ain't sinning enough, Eliz says. Dan laughs. laughs. I'll do something bad to fix that. He says he'll do something bad to fix that. I doubt it's possible for Dan to do something that bad. Promises that can't deliver Cruel illusions of success Close behind there's someone leaving Not even a second guess Tell me lies, tell me secrets Promises 
Paul's missionary journeys, including the shipwreck on Malta and the final journey to Rome. After dinner, Dan takes Jed for a walk out back of Hank's house. They walk a few hundred yards and stop on the edge of that ravine we used to play in. While Dan and Jed look over the ravine, I float out and see that the mine we dug is still there. A little worn and partly caved in, but still there. I go into the hole and feel good and happy, as if I'm home. When I come out, I wait for Dan to say something about him and me playing in this Ravina's kids. Instead, he tells Jed that this place is cursed. God's got no need for places that can't grow anything, he says. Take away all the topsoil. That's how you send the land to hell. People, too. Also applies to people. Jed nods. But he and I don't get it. What the hell does that mean? You all the water rushing down off this hill is taking all that good soil downstream down river toward the Gulf of Mexico. Dan talks on about how all the water rushing off this hill is taking the good soil downstream and downriver toward the Gulf of Mexico. I've been down in the Gulf where the Mississippi empties out, and you can see miles and miles of dirt streaming by. It clogs up the shipping lanes, builds up into salt bogs and uh, marshes. Is there any way for the dirt to be brought back? Jed asks if there's any way for the dirt to be brought back. No, but they bring other things up from the Gulf. Fire ants, for one. I wait for Dan to explain that to Jed, but he doesn't. As if the fool can't even tell my son one thing about what we all used to know. I spin the dead pine straw and leaves off the ground with another dust devil. Dan and Jed watch my little wind rip across the air as they sit on the edge of the ravine and dangle their legs into space. What was it like? Jed asks. The war and all? <laughs> well, well, it was cold, Dan says, laughing. But nothing your dad and I couldn't handle. I feel Jed's heart jump at the mention of me. And I get nervous as I wait for Dan to say more. You promised, I yell in a whisper to Dan. You promised you wouldn't let my son know. Tell him something else. Tell him how it was so cold that when the snow came there was lightning, lightning in a snowstorm. Tell him about the fountain pen in my breast pocket and how the ink froze and split the pen. Tell how we had to open and shut the breaches of our M1 rifles all the time so they wouldn't freeze shut. Tell how you once chipped the ice out of my nose so I could breathe. But Dan doesn't hear all of this. And I wait for him to tell my son how his father really died. How those endless waves of Chinese came at us. How I got so afraid I jumped up and left Dan alone in our foxhole. Left my best friend to die just because I was afraid. I wait for Dan to tell my son how when he found me later, a bayonet through the gut and almost dead, all I could do was cry on and on and make him swear not to tell my family how much of a coward I'd been. I mean, damn. There I was, dying without a thought of my wife and child. Not a care except how people remembered me. I wait for Dan to tell Jed about all of this. But Dan doesn't say anything else about the war. Instead, he looks at Jed and says, You remember that nickname your dad used to call you? Jed shakes his head. Yellowhawk, Dan says. Don't know where he got that name, but he called you Yellowhawk. The little dust devil I've been spinning falls apart in a straightening of the winds. When Dan and Jed walk back to Hank's house, I follow even more silently than normal. I can't believe it. Even after all I've done wrong, Dan's still doing right by me. today, including the free world, the communist states, and Wetumpka in 1962. Dan and Jed have barely walked in the front door of the house before Dan turns right back around and goes for a walk with Liz. Jed tries to go with them, but Hank stops him and tells Jed to go help Elijah feed the chickens out back. Too much walking going on here, Lord, I say. You hear that? Way too much walking. Still, I follow Dan and Liz. Did you tell him? Eliz asks when they're down the road a bit. The air around me turns cold. Did Dan already tell Eliz? But instead of saying what I expect, Dan simply takes hold of Liz's hand and says, I figure there's no need. Just be around a while. He'll get used to me. If I'd still been alive, I'd scream and kick at the sight of them holding hands. Instead, 
I think of how Dan's always done right by me, and I think about how my son needs a father. Thinking these thoughts gets me happy and sets little winds to blowing. I send them to rustle Dan and Eliza's hair and make them feel nice and calm on their walk. Later, on their way back to Hank's house, Eliz tells Dan she received another letter from the Marines, who still can't find my body. He's dead, Eliz, Dan says. I was with him. We talked about you and Jed and how much he loved both of you. And then he was dead. I float over to Eliz, who is now smiling. I wish I had said that before I died, I tell her. But I didn't. I was too busy begging Dan to forgive me. That's when I know that it doesn't matter if Dan tells people the truth about me. Everything I've done and been is past. It don't matter anymore who I am. Maybe now, in death, that's all I am. A passing comment to my son, a word or two about something I did here or there, a story about how Hank once punched a man who was me through a restaurant door. But when I think about what I really was like, maybe being just a few passing comments aren't so bad after all. I'm sorry for everything, I say to Dan and Liz. I'm sorry, Liz glances around as the wind blows her hair. She and Dan are still smiling. Once back at Hank's house, Dan talks to Liz about fixing up his parents' old place. He says the place needs a new roof and the back porch is falling down, but he thinks with a little work he can make it good. He also mentions that Hank said the church would offer him the full-time preacher job. Of course, I'd still need to find a real job to earn some money. I drift away at that. I don't need to hear more. When Eliz and Jed arrive back home before sunset, I'm tired and barely there. Jed goes to his room to dress for bed. When he doesn't come back, I go to see him. Eliz joins me a moment later. Are you okay? Eliz asks. Jed sits on his bed, rubbing my Bible. He said Dad used to call me Yellowhawk. Why'd he call me that? Eliz smiles, as if the nickname brings back memories of her own. Does it matter why? She asks. He was a good man who loved you. I know why, I should say. I know why I called you Yellowhawk. I know why Dan has come back here, and I know why I'm still here, and I know why I'm tired of this, and I know why I am. I know why. But I don't try to say anything. Not even my normal sighs and angry winds. Jen just smiles at his mama, nods to her words. And I'm gone. And no one knows. Tell me lies, tell me secrets, promises you never keep. Tell me that I'm not heading down the wrong way over one way street. Author's note. Jason Sanford here. This is a bit of an author's note where you can listen to me babble on about the writing of Maps of the Bible. Not sure why you'd want to listen to that, but here it is. Maps of the Bible is both a standalone story and the prologue to a short novel I've written called Jeremiah. The novel follows the life of a young man who witnessed his father kill his mother in a fit of jealousy and rage. In the novel, the main character of Maps of the Bible, the child Jedediah, is grown up and a well-known preacher. If you want to learn more about all that, you can find the novel on my website at jasonsanford.com. Getting back to Maps of the Bible, the story is based in part on family history, part on my experiences growing up in the Wetumpka Church of Christ, and part on whatever craziness I pulled from the insanity that is life. However, listeners will have to determine which parts of the story belong where. I hope you enjoyed it. How many times you sing that stupid song? I love that song. How many times have I had to cut that song out? Okay, we're back. Boy, it seems like we never left. Hope you enjoyed the story. I know I did. Sorry. Well. <laughs> First of all, I want to get it out of the way. I know you didn't like my accent. Stuff it. <laughs> Well, I thought it was very genuine if you were supposed to have been a prospector that lived in Nevada in 1843. <coughs> Thank you, Sorry. Josh. And on with the countdown.
Our next band comes from Winnetka Church of Christ. Their first time here on the countdown with every orifice on the lifeboat. Sorry, folks. Why did I even show up today? This show took a little longer than our average show to get put together. So much so that it's still being put together. (laughs) You might want to pause it for a minute to let us catch up. I had a hard drive crash this week. That I, I was 95% done with this week's episode as I was editing it down. And all of a sudden, I started getting some strange errors on my computer. And I went, oh, crap. Maybe I better restart this thing. So I, I, I thought I would do that. I restarted it, and it wouldn't turn back on. And I was like, oh, crap. 95% of the way done with the show. But yeah, then I, I kind of started worrying about whether I would have a computer at all after that. And I stopped worrying so much about the show and uh, just about how useless I would be without a computer. I've had problems with this computer and with everything else in my life um, falling apart and costing me money. And so anyways, I freaked out a little bit. But I, yeah, I had to take it in, get it fixed up. Um, but luckily, uh, you know, we've got a lot of folks in our Dune Steve community. That, uh, you know, they heard about my problems and, and jumped in to help out any way they could. And so uh, Brian Lincoln, for example, went through and did the story for us today. The one that I was 95% finished before it fell apart. It, Brian was able to pick up the pieces, the shattered remnants of my work and, and assemble that and, and get it together for us. So we had a, a an episode. And, uh, yeah, we'd really like to thank him for helping us out and like to thank everybody else for patiently waiting. It's almost like back to the early days of the show when we'd have a show come out. Yeah, once every two weeks, every two and a half weeks, maybe week and a half. Who knew? So that's where we've been, if you've been wondering. We lost a great deal of material as yeah. well. So it will be a little while before we get back to the almost weekly podcasting yeah luckily most of the readings that we've done uh those are all still intact but not the episodes that we did for after those readings we're gonna have to redo a lot of that so we'll still be around but it might be a little bit slower than we have been thanks brian yeah the saddest thing was that i had like a two minute burp reel that i'd built up over the last two years and it's gone 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 I was saving that thing up for the end of the final episode. We did listen to it once, just like three weeks ago, four yeah. weeks ago, all the way through. Yeah. And there were parts where I was just laughing so hard. <laughs> uh, so we, I got pleasure out of it. You won't ever get pleasure out of it, but at least we listened to it. I listened to it once. Yeah. So it was worth all that hard work I put into it. Yeah. <laughs> So this story was interesting. It was, I mean, it was somewhat, I guess, a sci-fi story. But when it came down to it, it was really a lot more of a... I dare you to say what it was. A biographical or literary kind of a story. It's more about this kid and, and his life as a kid growing up in the South. And But, you know, but, but, it's narrated by a ghost. Yeah, that's obviously what takes it out of that realm of just being literary and into... Perhaps a fantasy realm. But you don't classify it as horror just because there's a ghost in No. Don't you think somebody somewhere would? Maybe. They'd be like, oh, ghost. I'm sure people who don't. (laughs) I'll cut that. I'm sure there are. No, you can leave that. Generally, there are people that would poo-poo anything that has a ghost in it and say, oh, that's the horror. Even if it's... Christmas Carol has a ghost. Yeah, I know. It is for. It is literature. I mean, there are stories that are put up on the pedestal and say, this is literature, that include ghosts and include other things. But there are also, I think, people that just say, oh, that's horror, and I'm not going to bother with it. Oh, there's a robot in it. Well, that must be science fiction, and I'm not going to read it. I don't care. Rocky IV had a robot in it. There you go. You know, in the annals of literature, in the future, they will look back and there will be nothing higher than Rocky IV. Happy birthday, Polly. I believe in the future it will be referred to as the annals of literature. Oh. That's what Marty McFly told me. Yeah? I was wondering just the other day, which... This is totally off topic. Sorry, this is going to completely derail us. This conversation has derailed. You're mocking me, aren't you? Yes, that's right. So here's a question for you. Which 
pisses you off more. The fact that Pluto has been declassified and is no longer a planet, or the fact that people now say Uranus instead of Uranus. The Pluto thing is just a crime, and people will suffer for it one day. <laughs> Pluto is one of those unappreciated geniuses in their day. Galileos that are persecuted while they are alive, but when they're gone, they will be elevated. And... Is Pluto going somewhere? Fell off the list. Yeah. So the fact that they call Uranus Uranus now doesn't irritate you like it does me? Not really, because urine is still a dirty word. <laughs> yeah, that's the worst part about it, I think, that they say it this other way to try and keep it from being a dirty word, and they just made it a different dirty word. That's the way it is, and they just need to live with it. I want to live in Effington. <laughs> I want to die there, too. Guys, I thought you were talking about something else. So oh, were we, we were talking about the story. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about literary type fiction. And I was going to say, do you have any kind of a soft spot for this kind of stuff? I, I want to say that you do, because I'm pretty sure I've read a few of your stories that have less science fiction or fantasy or horror involved in them than this. They're just stories of kids growing up in some small town somewhere. Characters doing things and not so much uh, some kind of big idea or some kind of ghost coming along or, or anything. Well, growing up, I was only, you know, frightened by aliens looking in the window and molested by zombies a couple of times. Okay. And so the rest of my life experience was found itself into stories that, well, maybe they didn't have all that kind of stuff. See, I don't write stories like that because I was continually molested by zombies. <laughs> <laughs> you know that explains a lot I mean, we could just get you in that reclining chair and have you talk through some of this stuff you know that i wouldn't would have to some... try and work it out in my stories but yeah you know i have uh, a hard time writing stories that don't involve some kind of weird crazy idea like that i don't know what that means i have written a lot of stories about things that happened to me or things that could have happened to me or just ruminations sometimes that's easy sometimes there's a great temptation to put something genre in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think because of my personal tastes, I find it maybe unsatisfying to just read a story with no supernatural elements or no fantastical elements in it at all. And that might be a crutch for me because there have been stories that could have been just totally slice of life. You know, this happened to me and my best friend when we were kids. It would have been fine had Jack the Raper not popped up at the end <laughs> Jack the Raper or Jack the Ripper? Oh, Freudian slip there, sir. Uh, yes, like yes, yes. Said... yes, Ripper uh, <laughs> popped up and, and just ruined the ending of the story. Well, that, that's just me. I, I'm sure that there are other people who would, would, would rather that Stephen King write stuff like The Body and Shawshank rather than uh -huh. introducing ghosts and possessed cars and undead house cats and all that stuff into his, his fiction. And I always go back to Stephen King because he was kind of my writer at that Sorry to use this word, seminal moment in yeah. my childhood. Warning, today's episode contains language that is unsuitable for children or educated peoples. Should we just start over, we'll start talking about Jason's story again and forget about everything that has gone before? Probably would be a good idea. You know, when I was younger, pretty much the only thing that I read or watched on TV is, or well, I watched his movies anyways, not so much on TV, because I just watched, like, Growing Pains and, you know, Happy, Happy Days. Days. Quick, give me the theme to the Growing Pains. Uh, was it Show Me That Smile Again? That smile. Oh, that was a pretty terrible theme. Don't waste another <laughs> minute on your cry. And hey, didn't I already... warn people? Warning. Didn't I warn them that I would be singing? I think we cut that part out. Oh. Why am I embarrassed? <laughs> um, let's just move on yeah so anyways i was trying to say that when i was a kid i read i wanted to go out and see movies of all speculative fiction nature how dare you i was into science fiction i was into fantasy i was into a little bit into horror i really got into stephen king when i was a teenager I just did not like the kind of stuff that was just a literary kind of a thing. It was based on real life and kids growing up in a small town or whatever. That stuff wasn't what I thought was cool or it wasn't what I enjoyed. And I remember my ninth grade class, we were assigned to read Great Expectations. Ah, G-R-A-T, Expectations by Edmund Wells. 
Uh, no, actually, wasn't the well-known Dutch author. We read uh, Great Expectations by uh, Charles Dickens. And uh, it was like pulling teeth. It was so rough. I don't know what the deal was. I mean, sure, we were freshmen in high school, so we didn't want to know about this crap. It was lame. We were, we were bored. We were too cool or whatever. And I think in our textbook, we even had an abridged version of Great Expectations. To make it easier for on the students. Yeah, I guess, you know, there were parts that we didn't even see and like nobody could make it through. And what I wound up doing eventually, you know, I, I tried to read and I couldn't stand it and I hated it. And then I went and got the Cliff's Notes and I read through the Cliff's Notes right before we had to take the test on, you know, how well we read the book. And by using the cliff notes, I managed to score the highest score in the whole class on our hmm. test. And that score was an 81. Wait a minute, the high score in class was an 81? Yes. Did, did you by any chance get to this class on a very small bus? <laughs> no, it, it was a regular class. We just all despised this thing so much that, uh, yeah, the person who read it the most was the guy who read the cliff's notes. And the funny thing was, years later, I became a fan of Frank Muller. When I was just going through the library, checking out anything that Frank Muller read. And I think I've told this story before, but yeah, I got the great expectations that Frank Muller read. And I'm sure half of it was Frank Muller is such a great reader. But the other half was that I think I was older, mature enough to be able to handle this kind of stuff. And it was like a magical experience for me listening to this Great Expectation. This book was a completely different book, it seemed, than the one that I'd read in high school. And it was just so amazing. And it's, I would say, my favorite Dickens book and one of my favorite classic literature stories of all now. I guess I grew up and learned that, that there's more to life than just aliens and child molesting zombies and stuff like that you know there's good things to be found in everyday life and everyday kind of stories and so i've come to like that kind of a story now that i've grown up or whatever you want to say you know this isn't to say that i didn't enjoy the story because it, it had the ghost element to it uh-huh he was a ghost it wasn't just a narrator he tried to communicate and i did like that the attempts to uh, intercede in his family or in the real world. And I don't know if this was Jason's intention or not, but I felt sad about the story. Sad that his life was over. He had had his chance and it was gone. And then also sad that, you know, he had made mistakes and he was still dwelling on those, but nobody else cared. You know, the thing where the friend, we, oh, he's going to say what happened. He's going to tell the truth of how I died. And then he didn't. Was that intentionally sad, or was it just me becoming sad over something that's not sad? I think that was part of the arc of our narrator's character, that he had to be able to forgive himself for the things that he did and see that he was forgiven by everybody else, so he didn't need to be around anymore trying to watch over his son and make sure he doesn't know that he was a piece of crap. Because, you know, now that he's dead, people see the good things that he was. Sure, there was bad. Everybody does bad things. Everybody's done stupid things. Once they're dead and gone, there's no reason to dwell on those things anymore. I think we've spoken on this before. We talked about it recently, yeah, because where I spoke a little bit about my uncle's funeral. Right. And my uncle had alienated himself from his brothers and sisters by things that he had done. And I, I didn't know whether I should leave that in the episode or not when I was editing it. It was one of those things where I was like, gosh, this is kind of personal. And it may make me sound like a tool because I'm speaking ill-ish of the dead. And ultimately, it was relevant enough or, or maybe, maybe I just decided I don't care. If people think that I'm a tool, they will anyway. So I left it in. But yeah, this would have been a great opportunity to talk about that. Just once the man was gone... There wasn't any point in saying, yeah, and he did this. And I couldn't, oh, and it really hurt me when he did that, you know? Yeah. It's just like, well, let's choose right now. Let's make an unspoken pact to remember the good things and to just not mention the bad things. And to me, that was enlightening. It made me think all these people, or maybe all people, are better than I gave them credit for. Uh-huh. It's weird. But certainly you can read that into this story. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't feel like he was a piece of crap. I didn't feel like the narrator was a bad guy. Right. Definitely not. But he but, couldn't forgive himself for what he'd done. And he ran off and he left his friend because he got scared and he freaked out. 
to the point where he was dying and all he could do was beg this guy to forgive him for having done that. And, you know, his friend obviously did forgive him. I thought it was really interesting, that whole thing. The guy had to learn to, to forgive himself and to learn that his son was doing fine without him. And now his friend Dan was here to take care of him again. And, you know, Dan was able to convey what he would have said that he loved his wife and his son if he'd been able to. A nice redemption of our ghost, the way he was able to move on. It's funny, uh, when we very first started the podcast, who was the first writer who showed up a second time? We had the second story by the same guy. Uh, Ian, it might have been Michael Stone, but I just remember, I felt like he was our friend. Because it's like, this is the second story he sent us. Because he liked how we did the first yeah. one. And this is the fourth Jason Sanford story we have done. Well, we actually only did three of those on our own show. The uh, other one was for Starship Sofa. But... Right. And, and I've told the story before of how I contacted Jason. And I guess I'll tell it one more time. This will be like the retiring of the story. It's like when Jerry Seinfeld went on tour that last time and said, you know, I'm going to tell all of my old jokes and then they're all going to be retired. So you'll never again hear the punchline. There's no pants. There's no pants. So this is the last time I'm going to tell the Jason Sanford story. But the story was called about when thorns are the tips of trees. And if you're new to our podcast, uh, it was something that we read on Starship Sofa for Tony Smith over there. Uh, and if you could want to search through their archives, it's just a great story. And I, I felt impelled to email the guy, Jason, and say, dude, uh, we read this story and it was just awesome. Thank you for, for thank you. Like, he even knew we existed. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I, I wanted him to know that we existed and that I had thoroughly enjoyed his story. And if, you know, if he had any other stories, to send them our way, because I was a fan. And uh, I asked him for a single story. He gave me three. I shall call nothing fair beyond the gift that he has given me. What, do, what are you doing over there? Oh, didn't you ever read Lord of the Rings in high school? I was having sex in high school. <laughs> okay, that's something we're not going to retire. That, that, Bada bing! I, I warn you, that will come back again. Yeah, yeah, that is one of those jokes that just keeps on giving. Yeah, he responded and he said, thank you for liking my story and spelling all your words correctly. And here are three stories. Three! He gave us three! Have I said three enough? Three? And have I said it in a high enough voice? Three! He's like, here you go. And I don't know, if, honestly, now that it's a year later, <laughs> if he intended for us to do all three or for us to say, oh, I like this story. This is the one we're going to run. But I didn't give him a chance to say that. <laughs> I was just like, oh, thank you. We'll do them. And all three were different. Yes, yeah, very. The, the first one we ran on the show, we called Freelanga. He called Freelanga. Freelanga. Bastard. <laughs> And it was a very short science fiction futuristic kind of thing. Yeah. Then the second one was Book Scouts of the Galactic Rim, which was much more down home slice of life kind of thing. Yeah. But it was about uh, the appreciation of science fiction writers of the past. I tell you, there, there was a bit of fantasy element in that. Uh, and then here we've got this one which is even more slice of life, but it's also set in the past. It's more melancholy, ghost-related. And I'll, I mean, it's just these four stories couldn't have been any... Well, I guess they could have been different. One of them could have been in Swahili, and... Oh, I must finish my point. Yes, please. They were very different one from another. And really recently I read some tips on writing website where a writer said... Don't just write the same story over and over again. And I've noticed some writers that do. And I've noticed in my own writing that sometimes it's like a reworked version of an earlier story. And then I write another story that's a reworked version of another story. And I think he was saying to grow, you, you need to write stuff uh -huh. that's completely different. Definitely. Uh, Jason's. And you've read beyond just the four stories that we've narrated for the man. I actually just recently read Ships Like Clouds Risen by Their Rain, which is another story of his that he wrote somewhat recently. I don't know, within the last couple of years anyways. And yeah, that one is a, a very different story. It's set on another world and ships fly over and dump rain and other stuff onto their world because their world is continually sinking in on itself and, and it just builds up itself from that. And again, it's very different than uh, the other ones that we've read so far. So 
Yeah, I guess he's following that guy's advice and uh, he keeps writing different stuff. <clears throat> well, I'm sure Jason doesn't need to follow these tips on <laughs> writing for... Well, I'm assuming that that was intended for aspiring short story writers. Right. Now, if you were a published author who made your living as a writer, would you read how to write books or check out websites or go over to Mer Lafferty's I Should Be Writing to hear her advice? Would that stuff serve you at all? I don't know. I would assume that it wouldn't hurt. It's probably always good to get a reminder. Oh, yeah, don't do this. Don't do that. But I think this is something that you've said yourself um, when we've talked about writing is at a certain point you'll learn more about writing by doing it than you will by reading about it. Even aspiring writers, you know, that still needs to be 90% of the way you're learning your writing is just by writing. And with your other 10% of your time or whatever, you can go and read up how to write kind of a book. But yeah, doing the writing, I think, is the most important thing. And that's how you're really going to grow is by practicing Two or three weeks ago, we read a story, and the first thing I asked you was, do you remember the first story that you ever wrote? Uh -huh. When you read something that you wrote 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I, however long you've been writing, and maybe you see plot holes or bad dialogue or imperfections, because uh -huh. practice makes perfect, how, how do you feel about that? I usually want to work on it a little bit. Oh, this needs another draft. I want to polish it up or something. But I guess what I should feel is maybe a little bit of pride that I've progressed past that point. And so pride that you've progressed past that point. Right. Possibly. Possibly. Perchance to have progressed past the point. Probably. Please pass the peas. <laughs> Partner. This conversation has derailed. Didn't he it, say that before? It derailed at least three or four times. It fell so far off the rails that it eventually rolled back up on top. Yeah, it went around the entire earth and came back on the rails from the other side. Rich, you're such an idiot. Wait, he said it. What? But he's right, you are. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we should have deleted that whole thing. Sometimes I will read something that I wrote X number of years ago, and I'll just be bummed out. Because it's really bad. <laughs> but I know that all writing instructors... All writing teachers, all real writers, will tell you the first so-and-so number of stories or pages that you write is going to be crap. Uh -huh. And that's the only way you can get better is by writing this crap and eventually growing out of it or, or learning from your mistakes or looking at it and saying, oh, this is what's wrong with that and being able to identify that. So you don't feel pride that you've progressed past that point? Uh, possibly. Pretty much. <laughs> Mostly I just think about how much time it took me to write something and how not good it is. But then other times I'll be like you and I'll be like, you know, I can see the germ of a really good story in here. Maybe I should rewrite it. I remember I wrote this story. We were visiting my uncle in Vegas in 89 or 90. I'm going to say 90. And I, I wrote this story on his computer. Because, oh, gosh, he had a home computer. Oh, my goodness. And I printed it out, and it was on that paper that's all stuck together and has uh -huh. the little things on the side. It's been so long, I don't even remember what those things are called. Isn't that weird? Well, I think they had the sprocket holes on the side. I think that would be what you call it. Would you like to touch my monkey? The dot matrix printer, you mean? And those are so annoying. They go... <laughs> That probably should be cut. No, no, it's staying in. Because, <laughs> folks, that's what it was like, only forever it took. Yeah. And so I wrote this story, and I printed it out. And that was the only copy in existence. And I lost that. And a decade later, you know, in the 21st century, Whoa. century, 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 I remembered that story, and I thought, gosh, it's such a shame that uh, I wrote that. I finished the story. Because for me, finishing <laughs> is really difficult. Which apparently is the uh, opposite of the problem that you and your wife have. <clears throat> but, um, I thought, gosh, uh, I would be really cool to, to write that story again. And so I would have it because it was a lost story kind of thing. And, and so I wrote it again. And then, yeah, one day I, I went back home and, and my mom had a box of crap that she had found that was mine from high school. And, mm -hmm. and there it was. The original. The, the original one. And I compared them and the original was just awful. <laughs> And so it, I did feel like, wow, this is really bad. And the one that I wrote, this is night and day. Th that impressed me because I felt like I had really, really grown. And they were both telling the same story, mm -hmm. but in two totally different ways. 
And I could still remember enough of the story points that there was, oh, okay, this part happens here. And I told it this way. That to me was really revelatory, if that's a word. Enlightening. It was like, wow, I have accomplished something. I, I have grown and uh, I, I think I'll waste somebody's time talking about it on a podcast. Yeah, I made cool. that promise to myself that someday <laughs> I would annoy someone with an overlong story that really didn't go anywhere. I mean, you can interrupt me at any time. But... No, I, I want you to keep going with this. I think it would be cool for everybody to just have that kind of a chance. And I guess they could. I, I know that Orson Scott Card's first published novel was A Planet Called Treason. And ten years later or so, he had to go back and rewrite that book because he felt he'd done such a poor job the first time around and he had to redo it. And so he wrote it again. And the second version is just called Treason. I've actually only read the original version of Planet Oh, I've Hall only Treason. ever read Treason. <laughs> and so I don't know what the difference is, really. But now, he did this just on his own? In I his own so. free time? Or did the publisher say to him, hey, we're going to reprint Planet Called Treason? And he's like, oh, no, 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 don't do it. <laughs> or it did he go like to that. the publisher and say, and beg. can you give me some money and I'm going to rewrite Treason and you guys can publish it and pretend that it's a new novel? I... How did something like this happen? I'm afraid I can't answer that question. It's classified. It, um, it's out of my pay grade. That's right. No, I have no idea. I just remember one time being at an event or whatever it was that he was doing, and he mentioned that, that he hated it so much that he had to go back and rewrite it because he just couldn't stand all the uh, errors or the imperfections or whatever it was that were in there. And I know that I have rewritten a story that I wrote in high school as well. I wonder it would be interesting to go back and look at the two and compare them. My October Scary Story from last year was a rewritten version of something I wrote in high school. Did you have the blueprint in front of you, or did you just rewrite it from scratch? I rewrote it from scratch. I rewrote it from memory. So I don't know how similar they are, how much they're the same, and how much they're not. I think the new version is longer. It seems like as writers get older, they also tend to write more and more like Stephen King. And you look at his early stuff to his later stuff. So maybe I'm learning to blather on. I think that the new version will be much better than the old version. But I don't know. I ought to uh, compare them just to see. Well, how much would that suck, though? <laughs> if you looked at the old one and were like, oh, no. The new one has all these grammatical errors and spelling errors, <laughs> and it doesn't really go anywhere. It's like, wow, one. this is... And the old one that feels like a real writer. It would be like <laughs> people that always tell Sting that his music with the police was so much better. And he's mm -hmm. just like, ah! I've been trying to grow as a musical artist and write songs that have a Middle Eastern guy going, hey, 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 during them, and, and you don't appreciate that. Yeah, it would be just like that. They can't all be winners, folks. <laughs> And now it's time to beg for donations. What? Again? Dude, why do you make such a big deal about it? Oh, we're supposed to ask every single week. No! Look, I put my foot down. We, we shouldn't be obligated to do anything every single week. Well, I listen to you whine every single week, and you hear me complaining? No, I, I guess not. So beg. Beg, monkey, beg. Folks, we really need you to... Donate to the show so we can continue to pay our authors and our heavy cocaine habit. If you would just click the PayPal button up at the top, is it the top right of the yeah. of the site? Uh, you can donate anything you want. It, it could be just an obscenely large number, or a, I guess it could be an obscenely small number. But just obscenity is the key. Please donate, and we would really appreciate it if you did. Thank you very much. Okay, so I, I guess the whole point of sitting down here right now was that I wanted to talk about the three Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. Now that they're done and there's not going to be any more, what was good and what was bad. And months and months ago, we talked about Spider-Man 3 and I said that I never saw it again since the theater because I didn't want to hate it as much as other people did. Did you ever see it again? 
You know, I own the movie. I do too. I don't know that I've watched it, though, to tell you the truth. And that's the sad thing about DVDs and why do I own any of them. I own a lot of movies that I bought because I wanted to be able to share them with my kids or I don't know what it is that I thought I was going to do with it. But your kids have never watched it. Yeah, those? they haven't watched it. I haven't watched it. Nobody's watched it. I could sell it, maybe, or pay the credit card debt that I racked up for buying it in the first place. Who knows? I tried to avoid that at one point. I, I tried to make a rule that I wouldn't buy something on DVD unless it was something I would watch at least once every other year. Seems then, you know, reasonable. I'd get my money's worth out of it, but I don't even do that. Well, there's just too much stuff going on in life. I mean, we talk about it every single week, if not every single day, about all the things that we'd like to do and how much time the podcast cuts into that. And if we weren't doing the podcast, would we do all these other things? <laughs> no. and the answer is no, because nobody has 50 hours in a day in which you could do everything. But uh, the three Spider-Man movies, which one's the best? I think the second one is. Okay, you're correct. Um, <laughs> oh, I didn't realize no, yeah, I was being graded. <laughs> that's an empirical <laughs> knowledge question because, yeah, there's just anybody who says otherwise is selling something. I don't know. I, I've talked about this. I didn't love Raimi's first Spider-Man when it came out. And I still don't love it. I don't feel like it's a perfect movie. And there are some flaws that just bother me to this day. But every time they adapt like a book series or a comic books, something that I love into movies, I think I, I have difficulty with the first movie. But when the sequel comes out, I'm used to all these changes. So I'm able to just let it wash over me. And I'm like, yeah, okay. But I remember seeing the trailer for Spider-Man 2 when it hit. And there's that... I am Spider-Man no more moment. And you see the suit in the trash can. And I remember being just like moved. <laughs> the first time I think I've ever almost cried in a trailer. Although it probably has to have been a trailer that I actually made me cry. As, uh, I can't remember. I don't know. But it was just like, holy crap, that is right out of Amazing Spider-Man 50. And just the way that he framed that. And, and I think that's how Raimi got the part, the part, the job in 2000. That all of these directors wanted the Spider-Man movie. Uh, once Sony got it from James Cameron and they auditioned a bunch of directors. They did the same thing with uh, Harry Potter the year before where all these directors had their take. And Raimi came in there and he had all this stuff from when he was a child and he knew the characters back and forth and he loved Spider-Man and he gave them his pitch of how he would do the movie. And they were like, okay, you're, you are hired because he just had the passion for it. Cool. You know, he's just He was hungry for this property. And I don't know about Webb if he loves it or if his first exposure was the Raimi movies or what. But uh -huh. it can work to have somebody that's so in love with the source material like uh, for uh, Watchmen where he knows like every single page. Right. And that, or where you get Brian Singer. He's like, yeah, I never read an X-Men comic book in my whole life. And yet he made these movies. Yeah, he made some love. great movies. But it, it'll be so interesting to see how this guy chooses to do it. And I wonder – if they hired a somewhat inexperienced director so that they could walk all over him? Because, okay, with Raimi, he wanted to do The Vulture for some reason in <laughs> Spider-Man okay. 4. And everybody was saying that John Malkovich was going to be him. Uh -huh. So I don't know if that was rumor or if that was actually going to happen. It would have been a good Vulture, though. I think, I think ben, ben Kingsley Kingsley. looks a little bit more like The Vulture. Okay. But, but oh, well. They both um, kind of do, though. Yeah, eventually I guess they were going to do The Lizard. Because they've been setting him up, you know. Yeah, all he's, three he's movies, been in all the movies. But Sony had all these things that they wanted to do, and they wanted multiple villains, and they uh. they wanted Black Cat to be in it for some kind of sexual dynamic, and they were saying that they wanted Anne Hathaway to do the part, yeah. and Raimi was like, she wants a lot of money to do this, and how do you guys expect me to get the budget down and all that stuff if we cast Anne Hathaway and 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 I all that? Don't see her as the Black Cat either. Can you imagine her in the suit though? Ladies okay. and gentlemen, I'm going to give you – I'm sorry. <laughs> gentlemen, I'm going to give you a moment there. I think Rish is right. But I've seen her with the white hair for the uh, in, in the trailer for Alice in Wonderland and I don't think it looks good. Well, we'll never know. No. Yeah, we won't. You know what? It's best but to cast unknowns because, OK, if they had cast Ben Kingsley as the Vulture, I would be saying, hey, there's Gandhi as the Vulture. If they cast John Malkovich as the Vulture, we would be saying, hey, there's John Malkovich as the Vulture. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's, it wouldn't it be best to just hire these hell Canadian actors. What? Nobody's, okay, I, well, maybe I, I'm going too far here. <laughs> you know, people you've just never heard of. So that when they come like in, like Nathan Fillion, no, like when J.K. Simmons was hired for the first Spider-Man, 
that was J. Jonah Jameson. Oh, right. You know yeah. I mean? And now he's had a career since yeah, then. Yeah, I see him stuff. in other things but, later on. And every time I see him, I'm like, that guy is... Uh, it's J. Jonah Jameson. And, you know, they cast, you know, nobody. They cast Elizabeth Banks as Betty Brant. And so she's Betty Brant. But th- then she's gone on to have all these movies and, you know, a career on her own and stuff. So that's the advantage of casting all these cheap nobody actors is we see them as whatever their parts are. And then, yeah, if they want to break out and become Hugh Jackmans and stuff, that's great. Look what we created. I don't know why they uh, feel like they have to have a star in certain parts. And you know what? That may be why Sony was hesitant to have Dylan Baker be the lizard. Well, I know he's been in these movies, but he's not a star. We can't have him as the main villain. And that that bugs me because we're never going to see Dylan Baker become the lizard and and, and how that might have worked. Because that was an interesting dynamic in the comics. And, you know, that he's a good man. He's a friend that becomes this monster. And you don't want him to die. You don't want him to get hurt. But yeah. he's a monster, you know? It was a really interesting... Uh, last year, we used to watch the uh, Spectacular Spider-Man cartoons, and they did the lizard in that one in, the, in that same way, and it was really well done. If you haven't seen Spectacular Spider-Man and you like Spider-Man, you should see it, because it's good stuff. We've talked about this before. I talk about this with everybody. I talk about this with the death, that it's such a giant mistake to kill the villains yeah. when you've got a franchise the, the, to kill the joker in the 89 batman to kill green goblin in in the first spider-man the potential for stories in the future is suddenly cut off the only way to tell more stories is if you want to somehow unkill them have them come back from the dead right. or just reboot the franchise but instead of doing the whole reboot thing why can't the villain go to jail or get away or you know what i mean the the christopher nolan batman movies okay the first christopher nolan batman movie they seem to understand this completely where the scarecrow gets away ross al ghul I and mean, they're never going to bring him back but they could bring him back you know what i mean wasn't there a third villain uh, Carmine Falcone is not killed. He's still, you know what I mean? It's like there's still forces to fight. And when you know that you're going to potentially have a franchise like the James Bond franchise, which is in the 20s, then don't burn your bridges. Especially when it's based on a source material like comic books, where you're still telling Green Goblin stories 40 years after he was created. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like somebody else might want to do something with this. And, and it's just the fact that they have to shoot their load in the first movie <laughs> and kill these guys. I've never understood that. And hopefully with this reboot, they will fix that problem and say, you know what? We're in this for the long haul. This is not just a one movie thing. Our grandkids should be going to Spider-Man movies. In the Richard Donner Superman movie, they set up the villains that were going to show up in the second movie, and yet Lex Luthor didn't get killed. He's still out there to appear again and again. And I, I never understand the short-sightedness of these people that are like, okay, well, we got to off that guy. Otherwise, the audience is going to feel robbed. Maybe yeah. there is a percentage of the audience that's going to be like, oh, he should have killed him, yo. But those are the people that are bootlegging your DVD anyway, and they didn't <laughs> – well, I, and there was the other thing I wanted to say that oh. they didn't learn from the Batman movies. Why do they have the need to fill these movies with villains? Oh, yeah. And that... it's like, one villain is not enough. Of course it's enough. Yeah. I mean, the, the, for, with Batman, these characters have been around for 50 years. Jeez, there, there was so much potential with the Catwoman or with Two-Face or with I, I, even Bane who's this worthless, useless turd in Batman and Robin, <laughs> is a formidable, really interesting villain in the comics. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering if they're trying to fill many demographics at the same time, or it's all that filmmaking by committee, where everybody's got to have a say, and that's why you get so much crap thrown in there. We talked about that with X-Men 3 and Spider-Man 3. Yeah, they were if both those the same. had been cut in half... And split into two movies, both of those movies would have been exponentially better. Yeah. But unfortunately, they felt that they needed to do both of those stories in there. And yeah, it was just too bad. Yeah. Spider-Man 3 had three stories. That was a Batman and Robin attempt there where you had uh, Mr. Freeze. It's the chilling Ivy. sound of your doom. Mr. Freeze, Poison Ivy. And wasn't there one more? Yes, Bane. But Yes, sir. Warning, today's episode contained comments from Rich Outfield. Listener discretion is advised. One other thing that really surprised me in 2002 when Spider-Man came out, and it was, oh my gosh, it was a giant hit. It was. Um, 
was how much it appealed to women, to girls, I guess. And that really surprised me because traditionally comic books have been a boy thing. Yeah. Comic book movies have been a boy thing. And I think that's one of the reasons that they've had so much trouble getting like a Wonder Woman movie off the ground is they're like, well, the boys won't go see a movie about a girl and girls won't go see it anyway. But girls really, really responded to the Mary Jane character and the upside down kiss in the rain. (laughs) I don't know. Whatever they did there, I guess they did right. Because a lot of times these love, these romance subplots feel so tacked on or so artificial or so unnecessary. And in that movie, I dare say that was probably the strongest they ever did one where, you know, the love story was a big part of the movie and it just resonated with girls. Mm -hmm. And so after that point, it had to be in every single bloody movie, (laughs) whether it needed to be there or not. I remember, uh, gosh, which one was it? There was some superhero movie with a disposable love interest that was shoehorned in. And I, I'm thinking that it might have been Ghost Rider, but I don't know. But I remember when it came out, it was just like, enough. Just once. Let's just have a movie that's about the character, that's about the, the conflict or whatever. And let's not stuff a love interest in there. I mean, if it's naturally occurring, okay. But it was not and whatever. And almost all of these movies. I, I was thinking, well, you know, it's, it's not like women are so simple-minded that they will not go see a movie if there's not a love story attached. So I, I was sitting down with my cousin and his wife, and I said this exact thing, word for word to her. And I said, right? And she said, no, I won't go see a movie if there's not love interest. I won't. And it was one of those things where I sort of sat down my fork and asked for the check and never looked back. Never look back at your cousin's wife. Oh, that's that's a good point. I, <laughs> I don't know what I would have been doing looking at my cousin's wife. But you know what I mean? Maybe you don't know what I mean. I, I understand that the female demographic is a big part of movies. Yeah. And women are always complaining that their needs are not met in the bedroom by me. They're also, sorry, complaining that the 50% of people on the earth are women and yet most movies are, are geared toward men. But I just – I feel like I, I should have more confidence in women, that, that they're smarter than that, that they don't need this kind of stuff. If it's a, a compelling story, that they'll like it anyway and that they'll stand up and say, you know what? This is thrown in there just to placate the masses the same way that I feel. Am, am, I, am I off base in feeling this? I think you're all right. You know, nobody wants to be pandered to. But Ghost Rider wasn't seen by anybody anyways. Oh, well, it might not have been Ghost Rider, but <laughs> there have been so many comic book movies. True. And they can't all be Superman, where Lois Lane is a big, big deal. Mm-hmm. Of Batman still, although I guess uh, they tried to shoehorn that into the first couple of Batmans, but I wouldn't say that they did so much of that with Rachel in the uh, in the more recent ones. He doesn't really have a love interest like Lois Lane. But he's Batman. Vengeance fuels him. Uh huh. People went and saw Batman. They liked it. That's going to be difficult, though, uh, to continually try and find some girl to put in there. And you know they can't end up together because it's not Batman if they do. Spider Man at least got married until the devil stuck his paw in. Um, I, <laughs> but you know what I mean? I, maybe I'm just going on and on. I know this is a very long, self indulgent episode. But uh, these were just things that I wanted to talk about. There's there's lots of of girls in Peter Parker's life that you can go to or you can turn to and have there be some kind of romantic what if or I wish, you know, kind of thing. Or I can't be with her because my darn costume gets in the way and stuff like that. <laughs> and, and that's something that's really cool and easy to relate to. And all these Valentine's Day episodes that we did, none of them turn out all right. Yeah. And, you know, that's something Except that I love. Except for the anti-Valentine's Day episode. I mean, you know, I'd like to think that uh, if they made a Wonder Woman movie, if Joss Whedon had been able to make his Wonder Woman movie post-Serenity, uh, and that's one of those where there's an alternate universe somewhere where he did, mm-hmm. and we're all talking about, that's the way to do it. I wouldn't imagine, you know, there were a lot of guys that went and saw Wonder Woman that are like, Pfft. there was at no point where a dude came out of the shower with a towel on in this movie. This is bull crap, man. I want my money back. <laughs> but see, it's hard to know how that movie would have played. 
See, I would have gone to see it because A, it's Joss Whedon. And two, I think the Wonder Woman character was really interesting. Just the, the naivete of a warrior woman who has absolutely no exposure to man's world and, and just doesn't know that men are scumbags or that the world is corrupt <laughs> or, you know, all this stuff. That's such a strange dynamic. I wonder how that's going to work. I don't know. They made the cartoon. Did you see the animated one? You know, I haven't seen it yet. No. Oh, OK. Well. I think uh, that if they had somehow ported that over to live action, that, you know, people would have loved that movie. Now, granted, the main bad guy is a dude and the sidekick, the secondary character is a dude, you know, the, the love interest, although yeah, and it's the Nathan love Fillion interest never well. really works. Yes, Nathan Fillion, and you can't go wrong there. It kind of does make you wonder if Whedon had made a <laughs> Wonder Woman movie and here's Steve Trevor played by Nathan Fillion. That's not outside the realm of possibility, is uh-uh. it? Just we'll never know now. But uh, I you know I've always felt like uh, my sister has a girl, my cousin has a girl, you have a couple of girls. So I see a lot of things through their perspective for the first time, and it does seem like that there's a lot fewer role models for girls of, you know, people that are tough or people that are entertaining. The guys can enjoy too. You know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer is just an awesome role model for a girl. But, you know, it's Joss Whedon. Everything he does is... How about that dollhouse? (laughs) Wait, sorry. Okay, you're right. But it seems like if you made a Wonder Woman movie right, then a girl could feel about somebody the way that I felt when I was five years old about Spider-Man. And it's like, that's what I want to be. And I wish I could be that and that. Something to be proud of. Anyhow, I feel bad that Raimi's done. We don't get to see a fourth one from him because, okay, there were a lot of problems with Spider-Man 3. And certainly if we had Raimi here right now, he would say, you know, I would have liked a chance to redeem myself in the eyes of people with Spider-Man 4 where everybody's like, wow, you know, he went out on top. But, oh, well, you know, we're not going to get that. There's no going back in time. Wait, what if you had a time machine? I would rape Hitler. With, not kill him. Uh, I think uh, just rape is, is all he yeah, so yeah, there's there's no going back, but you know, we, we have a different look coming forward, so I guess we'll see what we get from that. I'm looking forward to it and hoping it turns out to be interesting. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. And that was our show. Hope you liked it. <laughs> you've got this glassy-eyed, you know, you're just so punch drunk. I've, I've talked for, for so reason. long. You're like, oh, please stop talking or die. Whichever. I. All right. So uh, that's that for our show, huh? Uh, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Night after night, my heartbeat shows the fear. Ghosts appear and fade away. See you. Good night. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. I was never familiar with that song in the 80s because... You know, I grew up in some kind of commune where we only listened to <laughs> ranchero Spanish music. Oh, okay. You know, the c- c- really crappy music where it goes... Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, yeah, I know like, that Ugh. stuff. I listened to that in my commune too. I guess you did. But yeah, there was this episode of Scrubs where uh, Zach Braff was trying to make some kind of decision. And every time he, it, it, he started to think about this decision he had to make, Colin Hay would appear with a guitar in, behind him and say, I can't get no sleep. Just thinking about the implications. <laughs> and he'd just be like, get away. And then he'd think about something else. And then he'd go somewhere else. And he'd be like, gosh, I'm going to have to make this decision. And it's like, night after night, my hobby <laughs> show. And I was just like, my gosh, this is the greatest song I've ever heard. This is so rad. So that was back in the days when everybody had Napster. Oh, yeah. So I went on Napster and I started to download this song. And I got an instant message from whoever I was downloading it from. And he said, dude. You just watched Scrubs, didn't you? <laughs> and I was like, yes, I did. And he's like, you're like the fourth person to download that song from me today. And I was like, wow, it was just so weird. Because back in those days, just the idea that there's another person who was aware that I am right. taking his song and he was that cool about it. 
wow, that's really neat. And yeah, oh gosh, that's one of my favorite songs now. I've probably listened to that song a thousand times since that day. Really? And Wow. Um, I wonder if I've ever listened to any song a thousand times. Well, you have that, uh, what's the yeah, program that everybody iTunes. uses to download our, our show, but except me? iTunes. It's yeah, like 99% it a... of downloads were from iTunes. <laughs> one guy just downloaded it himself. Yeah. That, that keeps track of how many times you've listened to something all the way through. It does, yeah. Unfortunately, I haven't been using iTunes for that long, only for a few years, so there's not that many. But yeah, I think the song that I listened to the most was something like 35 times, so a thousand times. Okay, I can't have listened to it a thousand times. You could have. I'm sure some of those songs that say 35, I probably listened to them more because I listened to them on my faux pod, my whatever they call them, you know, my not iPod that I had before I had an iPod. Those didn't count the uh, plays. If you play it on a CD, you don't have counts, you know, so... No, I hear you, but still a thousand times. That's just not realistic. Well, you know, like all those times a regular person will be out having sex and, and doing that kind of stuff, and you're just at home by yourself, just sitting in your underwear with your headphones on, okay. listening. Okay, you're not helping. Thank you. Sorry, I was just trying to, you know. <laughs> you're right. It's possible. It is possible. <laughs> Good night. See ya. The dumbass Pentagon pooper patients. <laughs> Those dumbass Pentagon pooper, pooper scoopers. <laughs> Those dumbass Pentagon pooper, damn it. Wow. Those dumbass Pentagon paper pushers always send the same form letter back. Anyway, this damn drunk man at the table behind them started cursing at the top of his lungs. Cursing the food, cursing the waitress, cursing the whole room, cursing the Dune Steve Audio Fiction magazine. How could anyone consider the idol? How could anyone consider that idol if God... Damn it. Sorry, folks, I didn't mean to curse. I'll try it a third time. How could anyone consider that idol a god if it couldn't even bring the reins? And back then it wasn't Brother Satorius. It was just plain old Dan who found me wounded on that frozen ground and couldn't do a thing because I was bayoneted good and going on dead. I don't deserve Dan. Yeah, I say I liked Dan from the very beginning. He had a quiet way about him. Each man or woman waits in line until they reach Dan. Then they say stuff like, Lovely sermon, Brother Satorius! Or shake his hands and... Was that Don Knotts? <laughs> lovely sermon! How, how did he... Andy! That was a lovely sermon, Brother Satorius! <laughs> Boy, this car sure rides well. Elizabeth. Eliz. Eliz, that's right. The Eliz. Eliz. Never got used to calling you Eliz. You always be Beth to me. Man, you got pretty bosoms. I want you to say, I say, I say. You don't want me to do Foghorn Leghorn? <laughs> how much, I say, how much is it going to cost? Map 7. The Apostles' Early Travels. Including the traditional location where Philip meets the eunuch, Rish Outfield. Hey! That means the devil's angry because you ain't sinning enough. He says he'll do something bad to fix that. I can think of something I could do right now to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. <laughs>